in composing composing your minds sati sampachanya intuitive awareness the way it is so when when i say that what does that do to you <laughs> Does that help in in uh, just bringing attention, paying attention? You know, the moment of attention includes the body, mental formations, the uh, environment, external, internal. Because it has a, a wholeness to it, it includes everything. Where, where thinking analysis divides. Even when you think internal, external, and you're creating uh, two things, aren't you? It's inside my mind, outside. <coughs> so, th- thinking is, is, you know, this is why I keep emphasizing to investigate. Uh, what thinking is as experience uh, not to think about thinking because then you that's a trap of the mind you can't get beyond thinking then one is stuck in that uh, you know just think 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 your way through life and uh, and every, and you'll always feel alienated or something missing you can always think of something, you know, of something better. Or you have memories. Memories stimulate thought. So, so then you, they'll trigger off various feelings, emotions arising from remembering things of the past. <coughs> so language is, is uh, memory. But intuitive awareness isn't a memory. You know, the words itself is is a memory, but the the words are pointing at a reality in the present. So what is that now? And then the attention, paying attention, alertness, heedfulness, oh, uh, mindfulness. These are the the English words that uh, convey that. Being here and now. <coughs> the thing with the future is that it's based on memory, isn't it? Uh, tomorrow is uh, is a concept in the present. And the future is, uh, you know, you project from remembering things, what might happen, what you expect or dread, anticipate, fear. So the future is uh, is not, you know, it's, it's, we, we don't... You know, if we let the future be a mystery, the unknown, that's that's good practice. Rather than trying to uh, have, uh, you know, everything guaranteed, certified, uh, figured out, programmed, defined, to make us feel that in the future everything's going to be all right. The future is the unknown. Death is the unknown. And not to know is uh, not knowing. And we think we know when we when we fill our minds with words and memories and 
promises and expectations, and so we we make people promise, promise that you'll come, promise that we'll meet, promise, uh, make a vow, make a promise, because this uh, for the future. So the society is is one that that uh, lives for the future, and the present is uh, generally ignored. We're planning, we're thinking about something else. We're not with the body, the 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 reality of this present, the the, the emotional state. So we can live in in a in a totally in in delusions, in illusory realms. So in the the touch the earth recognition, like the the Buddha before he was enlightened, before he was the Buddha, you know the touch earth a mudra calling the earth to bear witness is that's that's conveying mindfulness, isn't it? When the ascetic Gotama sat under the Bodhi tree, he touched the earth. Uh, And so that's a, that's a a symbol of this uh, awareness, groundedness. It isn't going off into an ethereal mental realm. So the awareness includes the body. You know, it's like touching the earth, bring the body into, because this body is here and now, this physical body. And when you, and it's an obvious fact, but we can go into a mental state and ignore the body, try to attain some kind of mental concentration which the uh, body is ignored. So awareness then is including the body. So the pos- in, in uh, traditional language we use the four postures, sitting, standing, walking, lying down. As reminders, is the movement, not just the, the sta- a static posture, but the movement of the body. This means this because it's moving, isn't it? And sitting and then standing up, walking, lying down, sitting, standing up, ho- walking, lying down. Awareness, alertness, with the breath. Uh, the four foundations of mindfulness. Satipatthana is conveying this. The Gaya Anupasana Satipatthana, Vedananu Pasana Satipatthana, feeling, being aware of, of uh, feeling. Sukha Vedana, Tukha Vedana, Atukha Matsukha Vedana. Or that's the, the you know, this feeling. Um, Good, feeling bad, neither nor. Titanu Pasana Saripatana, the state of mind, the mood. In Tamanu Pasana Saripatana, the, the Dhamma. <coughs> so in Tamanu Pasana Saripatana, this is the using these. Uh, Dhamma teachings, Four Noble Truths, Paticca Samupada, for awareness, not for kind of grasping ideas or holding views. So during these reflections and during the Shri, I've emphasized you know, how to use these these uh, teachings for awareness, <coughs> because uh, this investigating experience, the, the the Dhamma teachings that we have are, you know, t- they're, they're not my teachings. They're not you know 
my my take on life, and, uh, which can be influenced by my karma, my personality. But they're they're a tradition, you know. The, the first sermon of the Buddha, the Tamajaka Pawatana Sutta, is a, considered the first sermon after his enlightenment. So it's a, it has tradition behind it. It's from a long time ago. But it's about the present. It's not about a long time ago. <laughs> it's not an exotic teaching, a fascinating Indian philosophy from from ancient India. It's about Pachubanatama here and now. So like in now we have the uh, body of Bernard in the Chapel of Rest. <coughs> this temple is well set up because it, it is uh, in coming to this site, Amravati, 1984. You know, the intention was to build some kind of temple here. And but the the formation already the existing buildings these wooden huts and that were situated in such a way that we could build a temple like this with the with the Buddha image main Buddha image facing the east. That's that's uh, where it's supposed to be. And it, it was like we didn't have to really kind of change all that much because the, the situation seemed to be waiting for us. The Chapel of Rest, the uh, reclining Buddha etched into the glass uh, is the symbol of the, uh, you know, of times those they call the Parinibbana, or the, the um, Buddha when he was dying, facing west. So the east is always a sign of birth, isn't it? The sun rises in the east and sets in the west. <coughs> so the Chapel of Rest is uh, very kind of also a fortunate place to have just for you know these symbols: the east, west, sun rising, sun setting, birth, death. Just the Everything, these, these symbols, concepts, icons, images, they're for reflection, you know, they're to remind us. We're not trying to believe in, in, in anything, you know, to kind of force some kind of <coughs> superstition onto it, but uh, just using the the flow of our life and the the way things are. Set the setting sun is like in death, isn't it? The sun goes down. Of course we know the sun doesn't set. You know, in modern science it uh, proves that you know, the sun doesn't rise and the sun doesn't set. <laughs> and that's one level of understanding, isn't it? But in terms of experience, isn't it? in the present we see the sun rising and the sun setting you know and, and, and it's not to <coughs> say that we should see this the sun as not rising or setting but we should always look at experience through uh, these this modern science like the, the the planet is going around this, to do this we have to to abstract our experience because that's not how we're actually seeing it. 
in terms of you know sight vision so birth and death also is is um when the Buddha pointed, the, the Four Noble Truths pointing at this birth and death, beginning and ending. Not from scientific uh, analysis, you know, and physics and chemistry and all the rest. It's, it, it's been able to, uh, you know, recognize the way it is in terms of experience, that all conditions are impermanent <coughs> isn't some scientific uh, discovery it's just it's uh, a reflection on the way it is in terms of experience here and now <coughs> so meeting and, and separating as a kind of birth death experience isn't it the uh, the death in this sense isn't isn't physical. You know, we take the word death and apply it only to the death of a human body, but uh, now we're no longer, uh, you know, using language for that kind of definition, but uh, using it in terms of Dhamma, what arises ceases. Birth is arising, death is ceasing. So birth of the sun, death of the sun. Birth of a thought, death of a thought. The rising, setting, beginning, ending. These words are, you know, expressed in different qualities of experience in physical terms or mental experience. But but in Dhamma language, we're not interested in that kind of definition, in discriminating like that. We're, we're interested only in the way it is, in, in the experience of here and now. And so the three characteristics of existence, Anicca Dukkanata, very skillful, po skillfully pointing to uh, the the common characteristics of conditioned phenomena. They're not definitions of phenomena. All phenomena, so if it's mental, uh, physical, sensual, uh, psychic, whatever, you know, whether it's true or false, right and wrong, or whatever, you know, illusions arise and cease, thoughts arise and cease, fantasies, feelings, emotions, what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, the physical world begins and ends. Now, if that's all there is to it, then then there's only the the sape sankarani cha, or you know, there's only sankaras. There's only conditioned phenomena. There wouldn't be any possible liberation from it. We'd be we would have never have any perspective on it. We'd just be caught in the in the habits we develop which many people are, they're just victims of their habits. They don't awaken, they don't investigate, they don't understand themselves, they're just merely continuously repeating the, the same things, being caught in the same delusions, same assumptions, until they die. <coughs> so that the conditioned realm is, is uh, you know, this is the, to be seen, in, like in, sati, in uh, Four Foundations of Mindfulness, Satipatthana, is uh, investigating the conditioned realm 
in Tamanupasana Satipatthana, isn't it? Then we're, we're getting perspective on conditioned phenomena through Sakti Sampatanya, which then isn't, isn't a, a condition that understands another condition. We're actually in touch or liberated through awareness of the conditioned realm. So there is the unborn, uncreated, unoriginated, unformed. So it could only be through sati sampachanya that this that we that this unconditioned, uncreated is recognized, because it's not a condition. So you can't see it or. Or, or objectify it. <clears throat> That's why it's realization, awakening, alertness. Nonverbal. If you're trying to look for something called the unconditioned, you're going to be terribly disappointed. <laughs> <clears throat> You know, it's just an abstract word, isn't it? <clears throat> Where do you find it? Prove it to me. Or like like all the, uh, you know, in uh, Christianity where they say, show God to me. You know, where you've got to prove, scientifically prove that God exists. Otherwise, I won't believe it. And... Uh, and then the Christians do define God all the time, you know, and, uh, Trinitarian doctrines are, <clears throat> you know, it's usually child's version of an o- white-bearded old man up in the sky, a father figure. <clears throat> so is is God a condition? <laughs> If if a God is an old as a white bearded old man up in the sky, then it's a condition, isn't it? <laughs> <clears throat> or in awareness, then we're no longer, you know, creating conditions. We're actually in the state of enlightened of attention and. And recognizing that, like the Four Noble Truths, is really the skillful means. You know, very skillful teaching that to to uh, let go of the conditioned habits, conditioned identities, assumptions, so that what remains is pure awareness that you can't see and and know as a as an object but you can recognize the mindfulness allow you know is the opportunity the occasion we have to recognize awareness is like this so that's why giving you the <coughs> The, uh, you know, the sense of listening, poised attention, Af- there was some words like apperception, uh, intuitive awareness, these are just words too, but they, they're, they're not attainments of, you know, special States, but natural ability to to be open to the present, because that's all there ever is. You know, when you when you stop creating, uh, following the habits and the assumptions of your conditioned mind, it, it becomes very apparent. The insight, knowledge comes. Patjubanatama here and now. 
The future is the unknown, past is a memory. And like consciousness, it's um, here and now, isn't it? Awareness, consciousness, operating right now, it's like this. Consciousness without a form, say, with, with just awareness and non-attachment. But it contains all the forms. That's why it's like Intuit intuition. <coughs> it's uh, holistic, as they say. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, it, it's non. It's not divided into two. As soon as you try to figure it out, then you're back into two, isn't it? Because uh, thought is. You know, when you try to figure out all this with your intellect, it, you end up with uh, back in the dualism of, of the thought process. And that's why recognizing this insight into awakenness is like this. And that's why I point to use the term sound of silence because then in this awakenness there is this this is the like a it's it's recognizable it's uh it's not a created condition the thought the thought process isn't operating And the mindfulness connects. One can sustain awareness. You know, not not just be caught in fragmentary moments of you know flashes of in of awareness, and then going back into the old uh, habit pattern. This is a way of transcending that, those tendencies towards just establishing, recognizing. So then in, in, you know, like a retreat like this gives us a kind of uh, special opportunity to, to just concentrate and, and to determine to, to break through the delusions we create around ourselves and the world we live in. You know, it's uh, giving as much encouragement and occasion, opportunity, then, uh, you know, <coughs> conditions change, retreats end, retreats die. Central heating dies. <laughs> because central heating is not the ultimate reality, as it began in the... <laughs> But then the challenge, you know, the reason why I, I've I found this sound of silence so uh, powerful in practice is because it integrates, you know, it's, a, it, it's once you start noticing and, and valuing it, then it, it, it's wherever you are, you know, it's not dependent on central heating, on a temple, on a retreat, on even feeling well or healthy or 
everything going well or s or everybody being silent so this is a way of of uh, you know integrating awareness the uh, practical way of of developing that into the flow of life of uh, traveling of uh, working ordinary daily life monastic life monastic routine layman's life whatever you have to do whoever you have to live with whatever work you have to to do this uh, the challenge then is to keep remembering this being this stillness in the midst of the turmoil of the world <coughs> so like the lotus blooming in the midst of the inferno is indestructible this is a image that a buddhist uh, kind of image uh, that i've always liked you know that i have this picture and my mental picture of this beautiful lotus which is uh, you know, a delicate thing. Flowers, you know, they're not, they're easily destroyed. But a lotus, which seems delicate and refined in the midst of an inferno, which is a, you know, raging fires, <coughs> is indestructible. So that lotus, then, in the midst of the inferno, is this awareness. And so the the inferno goes on. It doesn't mean that, but the but this awareness is indestructible. So it's a uh, akupa jeda vimuti. It's uh, it's the still point. It's the the refuge that we all can take refuge in no matter what's happening you know both physically mentally or in the society in the world <coughs> now the thing is uh, you can be you know find that very inspiring or whatever but in, uh, to practice that put it into uh, practical situations. So training yourself, like in uh, traveling, or uh, riding on the London Underground, or uh, airplanes, or in uh, social situations, or in committee meetings, washing the dishes, sweeping, hoovering the carpet, Digging in the ground, planting trees, putting on your clothes, taking them off, bathing, brushing your teeth, shaving, going in and out of doors. Remember years ago we had I did the, we had a whole meditation on doors because there's so many doors in this monastery, and then. And then in the Bhikkhu's Vihara, people keep slamming doors, you know, and you're living there in the wooden buildings. And then they walk like elephants down the passageways and uh, slamming doors. The monks were complaining about, you know, the noise. <coughs> and so then, uh, you know, thought, well, why not? You can take something like doors as a reminder, you know, every time you go in and out of a door. There's a lot of doors here, isn't there? It's just to get inside the temple, you go through three sets. <laughs> if you come in the, en the front entrance. Or into the sala, or into your room. So, like, like you can... You can determine to make doors, you know, emphasize them, determine doors as an object to 
to remind you to, to go in and out of the door mindfully, to open it and then go in and then close it mindfully, not just because we can just open the door, walk in, slam the door, or not even close the door. I used to suffer a lot uh, around, you know, in the winter time here in the sala. <coughs> People come in the doors, you know, we'd, we'd be heating up the sala so it's nice and warm, and then People come in and leave the door open, and all the cold air rushes in. I used to really feel murderous sometimes. And then it's surprising the warmth, and then and he just opens the door and looks, walk in, and leave the door wide open. But one had to also look use that situation when things don't go well and people don't close the door, slam the door. The sound of silence is still present. Awareness. This is this is the refuge, not in getting everybody to to uh, you know close the doors properly and not make any noise and be perfectly good, sensitive, politically correct, uh, compassionate loving, nurturing monks and nuns that uh, never feel any kind of negativity but just ooze love out from every pore, every moment. And we, we obey all the rules strictly and we're impeccable in every way. That trying to make, make everybody be like that <coughs> can only lead to increasing cynicism. <coughs> But we can, uh, you know, learn from experience. And the still point then, this, this uh, awareness that is that we recognize through awareness, then we can be aware of the way it is, the, the way people talk or how it affects us or the, and they don't close the door and on a cold day and we feel angry. The awareness includes the whole thing, doesn't it? The, the uh, frustration, the anger, the guilt about being angry, <coughs> the resentment towards the person. <coughs> and all these are conditions that arise and cease. But the <coughs> stillness is indestructible so just like doors uh, you know using the monastery here you know skillfully like really like you're walking from the temple to your room to your kuti or from the temple to the sala or the monk's vihara to the Sala and the Sala to the monks behind. These are like for John Grom to be to you have to determine to do this, so that it, it, you remember to. If you don't make a determination, you just it might be just a passing uh, thought that you don't that you know you you forget it immediately. But something like doors are, I found very helpful. The same doors, especially because you have to slow down, you have to stop, don't you, to open the door, close the door, crossing the threshold into the room and then closing it. Uh, noticing uh, the the handles on the doors, or the doorknobs, you know, the whole process of opening and closing can be, you know, determined as a way of, of slowing down, of not just rushing about and, and uh, 
doing things because you you want to get to, to some place on time or you're just l living and you know aiming to get to the sala your whole idea is to oh the time for the meal rush to the sala totally heedless you're in your you're in the monks vihara and and you oh so it's so, only a couple of minutes left better rush so then we we're already, you know, the mind's already in the sala and the dragging the body. And so we, our life is not, you know, it's just a matter of conforming to periods of time and meal time, puja time. And then free time means we can be totally heedless. So the challenge then is to, you know, use, use the situation you're in. And these are, you know, individual choices. There's got nothing, you know, that everybody has to do. But, but you know, how to develop this awareness. So it, the, the four postures, the sitting, standing, walking, lying down, are, you know, the movement of, that you go through in a day and night are, Part of the practice, practice is an ongoing thing. It's not just dependent on a retreat situation, sitting still in the temple. Like I found, like chanting is with the sound of silence. And I can actually, you know, and I chant. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato. And with the sound of silence and that chanting, then it's the mind doesn't wander. It's the, it's with that with the actual chanting that I'm doing. Where before I used to, you know, once you learn Pali, you know, you just Namo Tassa Bhagavato, and your mind's going, you know, not with it. You just kind of mechanically perfunctorily kind of saying it and then then santini ko karagwe pasigo pranago bachatang mo jitong and so you you're just trying to get it over with get the puja over with so you can sit and uh, therefore it you know, so it, and it just one just uh, you know can form, perform ceremonies in chant just because it's part of tradition. But you can even, you know, it just, it's kind of a duty, something you have to do if you're in the in this monastery. Or it can be mindful. I find that like with the mindful chanting then is. It's quite uplifting, you know, to say Santitiko or Kaliko, Ehipatiko, Opanaiko, like that, with awareness. And in the English translation, so that the, the meaning of these words, so the, the, all the chanting that we do is quite profound, actually, the meaning of it. Or it can be just perfunctory, you know, just Namotasa Bhagavato without, you know, with the mind wandering everywhere. Or like giving precepts. You know, I used to notice, in, you know, like uh, when I give the precepts, five precepts or eight precepts, you know, the mind would wander. And, and the biggest fear I used to have was forgetting where I'm at which precept I gave last. They think, Bana di Bata, Veramani, Sika, Badang, Samadhi, Ami. Then they repeat it. And but I wouldn't be there. I'd be, my mind would be somewhere else. And then I, which one did I just give? I couldn't even remember, even though I just said it and, and, they, and it had been repeated. 
so that the, the mind would would just wander all over the place and, and then in uh, training to give the precepts in the with the sound of silence as a background you know the mind is empty and with what you're doing what I'm doing is I'm with it you know I'm not you know, I, I know what what it is, and so it's it's more also. It, it feels like it's then it's it's really what it's meant to be: giving the precepts, taking the precepts. It's not just a, a you know Theravada custom that you should do. It's no longer just duty and and repetition, meaningless ceremonies. So this is, you know, this is a a way of training yourself with awareness that that is uh, in the flow of life in a, in a monastery monastic life. It is a certain style to it. It's the way it is, you know, the, the our custom, our tradition, uh, the alms food, the the uh, all this is a uh, is a is a certain you know the, is is a way that we live. We all agree to live like this, this way. So then, to you you know to to uh, not just take it for granted or just go through go through it you know in, in, as if it was nothing to do with uh, your meditation. Your meditation is only when you're sitting. Uh, still in the in the in this temple on a formal retreat, and the rest of the time is is just kind of waiting for the next retreat, and then resenting, you know, having to work or do things because you'd, you'd rather uh, sit in the temple, seeing everything else is kind of inferior or not as good as so. And then you get into this division again. I remember in, in uh, meditation center in the states, uh, used to have, you know, they they'd have uh, these formal retreats all the time, and then the staff that ran the retreat center would always feel frustrated because they had to work and and do the administration and cleaning and cooking and things like this and. And the ones that were on the retreat could sit in the meditation hall all day long. And they were really doing the work. And the staff was just, you know, frustrated because it had to, you know, it couldn't do that. There's resentments. You know, because the, the yogis, they were doing the real work. And the staff was with the, with the donkeys. You know, they just had to. And so when you start thinking like that, you know, what, what is it? You know, you're just, the resentment starts. You think real practice is, uh, is formal meditation. And anything outside of that is not real practice, you know, is somehow inferior. Well then, of course, the, you know, we want to do the real practice. <clears throat> So that is all a matter of, you know, that's thinking, preferring, having opinions and views. The whole, you know, if, if that's all you're doing, what good is real practice if you aren't breaking through that illusion? You know, if you can't see through it, and it's just perpetuated by keep doing the same thing, you know. I don't have time to, to work. I'm a yogi that, you know, I'm doing intensive practice. Don't bother me. Your duty as staff is to make sure that everything is provided so I can do my practice. So shut up, get to work, leave me alone. And that that's a mental state that is certainly unbeautiful, isn't it? 
And if that's if that's what we're becoming, uh, you know, uh, through our meditation, you've you've missed the whole point. You've lost it. <coughs> So like also having a Buddha Rupa or some something like this and like using the Buddha images. You know, developing that is a is a sign. You know, 'cause it it's the to to bow in front of a Buddha image mindfully, in the in the stillness of the mind, not just to you know, to uh, do it out of duty or obse- or a kind of obsession, compulsion. That's what you should do when you enter the temple. You should bow the Buddha Rupa. <coughs> and it's always, you know, stopping, uh, getting down on your knees, bowing in the stillness, lighting the incense sticks, lighting the candles in the stillness. Inner stillness, not stillness of, you know, the temple has to be silent, but in the inner stillness. So that then, uh, then everything's helping us. You know, the the um, Buddha images, the candles, the incense, the flowers, the monks and nuns, just the, you know, just seeing seeing the samanas, like for lay people and for the samanas, just the, the form, the the color, the robe, shaven head, rather than than dwelling on, uh, you know, making these as, per, you know, defining them as personalities. It's uh, it's an outward symbol of sangha. You know, it's a it's an icon in its own right, the sign of sangha. But it's so easy to make monks and nuns into personalities, you know. For us too, even we do it, even I do it. It's so easy to to um, personalize the this monk is like this, this nun is like that. But say training in in uh, in uh, with awareness, then it's it's we getting to you know changing, just recognizing the using a form. Such as the samana form, the shaven head, the robe, as a reminder, you know, of sangha, refuge. Not you're taking refuge in 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 a personal monk or nun or in monks and nuns in general. It's not. Uh, it's a. It's it, like symbols we can use for awareness. They stop. Say that just the the. Uh, Perfunctory flow of habit and thought, and that to just uh, stop the just the the wandering, uh, proliferating thinking mind. So it's like like one time. I was in the, you know, when I went to Thailand, you know, and Thai people would say uh, how much the, just having monks come on Bindabat meant to them, you know, going on their alms round in the morning. And uh, in Bangkok, you know, people would 
would be so grateful that you go out on the to gather alms food and they'd people be waiting or you know eagerly they're glad to see a monk come on the alms round in the in the robe the orange robe so then uh, <coughs> And then even in the uh, in Wat Bap Pong or Nana Chat, and you know, people all villages would were really happy when we'd go to see the robe walking through the through the village on alms round. And then the people would say how much that meant to them, how it made them feel good just to see that. It's like a you know, part of a culture that something in the culture that that uh Means something more than just the mundane, ordinary busyness of life. Stops them, you know. They stop just the worrying, um, habitual things, uh, habits. To just for that sense of respect of just seeing a shaven-headed monk wearing an orange robe with an alms bowl. So and then I lived in Thailand for for 11 years and I became like that and I remember it really uh, stuck me as a, when I was in I was had to go to the hospital one time in Bangkok where uh, you know and I wasn't um, was on a ward where you know, it wasn't a monk's ward and I was just kind of alone there as a monk and then uh, one day I got up and looked out in the morning out, you know, it was up on the third or fourth story of this building and then looked down and there was a monk on alms round, orange robe, shaven headed with an alms bowl. And I felt this kind of joy, <laughs> just a contact, a high visual contact with this form, you know, of, of just something so... Um, Kind of uplifting, you know, just that image, the the effect of that, of of that form. I didn't know the monk; it wasn't like anything personal whatsoever. But just that, you know, how that that does the the what the con, the icons, the symbols, the forms we have <coughs> do have a, an effect on. On our minds. Now, in uh, with awareness, then, if we if we just see the monks and nuns in terms of personalities, then we, we that tends to, you know, then we we identify like with a name, isn't it? When we give somebody poly name. and uh, and then it. You know, somebody who's who's who who's died or disrobed, we give somebody else that name. Takes a while, doesn't it? Do not think of the other person. Like the name Ananda, wasn't it? So identified with Arjun Ananda when I gave it to the present Ananda. Me, even me, and I kept because the the name was so, the the sound Ananda was so identified with. The other Ananda, the first Ananda. So, I'd like to do that intentionally, just to see that these, you know, how names represent, you know, easily become persons, you know, personalities. Where these poly names are not to, not to, to emphasize personality. You know, to kind of reinforce our uniqueness as personalities. Sumino is a name I've never dared give to another one. (laughs) 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 I will eventually. (laughs) 
So that awareness and mindfulness isn't dependent on conditions. You know, this is this is why it is a refuge. Because a refuge, if it's just dependent on things being a certain way, then it's not what a real refuge. It's a temporary, you know, temporary refuge, maybe. But it could also be destroyed. <coughs> But the lotus blooming in the midst of the inferno cannot is indestructible. So that's that's an image in the, the, uh, that I've found. What is that? That lotus, which is a totally unaggressive, uh, you know, del- it seems delicate and very indestructible. You know, easy to destroy a lotus. But the lotus is a is an ancient symbol, you know, in in it it is that meaning for that purity, that pure essence, stillness, and and the this this stillness, this uh, that we can only uh, recognize or be through awareness, through awakeness. And recognize, then that is the, the strength. It seems like a delicate, at first it seems like a, you know, very delicate thing, dependent on, you know, like a, a lotus blooming in a, in a special environment, a greenhouse. We have to have the temperature just right or it'll die. We've got to, you know, every little possibility of a, of a, Fly or an insect or something is so 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 rare, so exotic, so delicate a plant. We have to spend our time trying to protect it at all costs. Or is awareness really, you know, it's indestructible? And this you find within yourself, you know, through through the what we call meditate through pavana, through reflection. That which is, it can't be destroyed by changing conditions, by the birth and death of thoughts, emotions, comings and goings, successes and failures, the inferno of samsara, the busyness, the stress, the the demand, the the crises, the catastrophes, the tsunamis, the whole lot of samsara. What is it that is indestructible in when destruction is happening all around you? And then this, you recognize and develop this. It might seem very delicate and frail in the beginning because we aren't used to it. We, but it's not. <coughs> Important thing is to recognize it. This is it. And then too, uh, you know, the the movements of our bodies, the the emotional habits that arise and cease and the thing and the karma that we experience is then seen from this this center rather than just being caught in the in the spiral of samsara. If we throw ourselves out in samsara, then we're it's like being caught in a vortex and then just whirled around. And it is frightening, and there's a lot of fear in the samsara. Because it just it just you know goes on and on and on and and you can't you can't find any safe place in it it's always there's always this sense of danger and lack and something missing but in the 
when we recognize the stillness, the natural stillness, then the samsara is no longer, it is what it is, but, and, but it's not. It's not, no longer has the ability to delude us, to blind us. 